Hello everyone, welcome back to class. Today we're going to be finishing up the second half of chapter 5 of Medical Ethics and Humanities. Last time we looked at medical futility, the goals of medicine, and the means of medicine. In that lecture we tried to investigate how far a healthcare professional's duty extends what the proper goals of medicine are, and perhaps should be, and the means that healthcare professionals employ to appropriately meet those goals. One of the things that we discussed is that healthcare professionals do not have a duty to engage in healthcare interventions that are not going to be beneficial to the patient. And we talked about well, what exactly should the goals of medicine be? And how do we apply the appropriate means to advance these medical goals? We talked about working for the care and interest of the patient, safeguarding against illness and disease, caring for patients, and trying to cure them of maladies if we can. In this lecture, we're going to investigate what constitutes violations of medical practice. And this is going to involve looking at a few cases in which either the proper goals are not being advanced, the proper means are not being employed, or a mismatch between the means and goals in healthcare interventions. We're also going to talk about how healthcare professionals can adhere to proper standards of conduct, more specifically, medical professionalism, what it means to be a professional working in a clinical setting. First, let's go over violations for medical practice. This is going to be a general framework I'll try to inject some more specific examples when I can, but I will allow you to kind of fill in the blanks using your own experience and your own history as a good little exercise for internalizing some of this information. Basically, violations of medicine transgress what the authors have been calling the internal morality of medicine, otherwise known as the rules, principles, goals, and means of medicine taken all together. The general idea is, look, in healthcare settings, we need to adhere to certain rules uh, if we're part of a care team or if we're a doctor or a surgeon. We need to operate according to certain principles, like autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. We need to allow our actions or perhaps make sure our actions are based in sound ethical theory. We need to make sure that we're advancing the proper goals and we need to make sure that we are utilizing the proper means to meet those goals. Violations of medicine in some way fail to adhere to either the goals of medicine the proper means or the goal and means taken together, what the authors have called the means and fit. If an inappropriate goal is being pursued, the authors call this goal illegitimacy. And a good example of this is laid out in case 5A, which we're going to go over now. A plastic surgeon performs a breast augmentation on a young woman of average height, pre-procedure breast size of 34C, post-procedure size 56 double F, who wishes to embark on a career as an exotic dancer. Would breast augmentation be consistent with the internal morality of medicine? So would it be appropriate for a healthcare professional 
or a surgeon in this instance to perform a breast augmentation because the person wants to embark on a career of being an exotic dancer. How should they tackle this situation? Is this proper? Would this be a good motivation to engage in this procedure? Well, here's what the authors say. Recall that the goals of medicine, as enumerated earlier, included one, the prevention of disease and injury and the promotion and maintenance of health. Two, the relief of pain and suffering caused by maladies. Three, the care and cure of those with a malady and the care of those who cannot be cured. And four, the avoidance of premature death and the pursuit of a peaceful death, or what we might call a good death. There is, however, nothing in the facts of this case to suggest that the woman in question is afflicted by any disease or malady, because, as defined by Clauser, Culver, and Gert, quote, a person has a malady if and only if he has a condition other than his rational beliefs and desires, such that he is suffering, or is at increased risk of suffering a harm or an evil, such as death, pain, disability, loss of freedom or opportunity, or loss of pleasure in the absence of a distinct sustaining cause. The pursuit of any of the first three goals, the authors say, requires that a malady be present. Nor can we seriously argue that the fourth goal is being pursued here. Consequently, the act of augmenting her breasts surgically advances no legitimate medical goal. That is, in this case, there is goal illegitimacy and is therefore a violation of the internal morality of medicine. So it would be fine if she went to some other clinic or setting to have this procedure done, but a surgeon, let's say in a hospital, is not obligated to perform this procedure on her. And in fact, doing so might be a violation of the internal morality of medicine. So that's an example in which there's an, if this were to happen, there would be an inappropriate goal being pursued, in this case, a non-medical goal. And we would have a violation of medical practice, an example of goal illegitimacy. Let's now switch to another example of a violation of medical practice. If inappropriate means are employed, this is what's known as means illegitimacy. Case 5B talks about this. It says, A retired military officer with pain secondary to incurable metastatic cancer asks his physician to shoot him in order to put an end to his pain because, in the words of his hero, George S. Patton, quote, There's only one proper way for a professional soldier to die, the last bullet of the last battle of the last war, unquote. Would shooting this patient be consistent with the internal morality of medicine? What do you think they're going to say? N no. But, right? This is not appropriate. It would be uh, a violation. Here's their analysis. The act under consideration furthers the goal of relieving pain and suffering caused by maladies and might arguably result in a peaceful death and therefore is goal legitimate the means under consideration, however, are non-medical. Thus, the act in question employs an illegitimate means. It is means illegitimate and would therefore be a violation of the internal morality of medicine. A doctor would be violating the internal morality of medicine if he shot this guy, who, even though he has an incurable disease, again, that means is non-medical. It would not be appropriate in this context. So there we have two examples of an inappropriate goal being pursued or inappropriate means being employed to affect some sort of health intervention. But there can also be a mismatch between the means and ends. If they're not appropriately related, then we have what's called a means ends disjunction, which is the third way that 
there might be a violation of the internal morality of medicine. The authors lay out that the prime example of this is medical futility. When you have cases of medical futility, the means and the ends are not appropriately connected. There's a mismatch or a disproportion there. And they provide case 5C as another example of this. A patient with a thin, that is less than 0.76 millimeter melanoma on his left leg undergoes an appropriate surgical excision. So they take it out. He subsequently requests that his surgeon amputate his entire limb, just to be sure. Would such an amputation be consistent with the internal morality of medicine? Or would this be a violation? Well, here's what they say. Patients with such lesions, treated as the patient has already been treated, enjoy virtually a 100% cure rate. Although the goals being pursued, cure of disease and prevention of premature death, and the means employed, amputation, here are legitimate, in this case, the connection or nexus between them is too loose. The standard of care demands the less extensive surgery that the patient has already undergone because the performance of the more extensive surgery that he is requesting will neither increase the likelihood that he will be cured nor decrease the likelihood of premature death. Amputation of the limb, just to be sure, would be a violation of the internal morality of medicine because of means ends disjunction. So we can see here that this extra amputation of the limb would not do anything to really serve this patient, right? The excision has already occurred and such patients who are treated in this way enjoy virtually a 100% cure rate with this particular kind of melanoma. Thus, this procedure is not going to increase the likelihood that he will be cured, nor decrease the likelihood of his premature death. So we have a mismatch between the goal and the means. If the doctor were to engage in this amputation of the limb, that would be a violation of medical practice. Thus, we can say, in medical practice, healthcare professionals need to be cognizant of the goals they're pursuing, the ends that they're employing, and whether there is a good fit between the goal and the means to get there. If there is an inappropriate goal, means, or fit between these things, that in general is what constitutes a violation of the internal morality of medicine. We don't want to put our patients in unnecessary pain. We don't want to do things to them that will cause them unnecessary harm, even if it produces a benefit. We don't want to inflict a health intervention on them that is unnecessary or that doesn't serve them. These would all be violations as well. Violations in medical practice are often intimately related to what it means to be a professional in these settings, which is why the authors of this chapter talk about professionalism also in this chapter. See, the practice of medicine is a profession. They define a profession as a vocation or occupation requiring special, usually advanced, education, knowledge, and skill. Insofar as the practice of medicine requires a certain education, knowledge, and skill, we need to make sure that those without knowledge, skill, or education are not practicing in these settings. And those who are, we should hold to certain standards and codes of conduct, fitting the profession of medicine. As you all know, the practice of medicine necessarily involves dealing with vulnerable patients, and care teams have some sort of control over human life. So when it comes to this very intimate, kind of effective, um, consequential profession, 
we should expect the people operating in this profession to, well, adhere to certain codes of conduct, to exhibit a kind of professionalism in their work. Patients are putting their lives in your hands, or they will if you're going to get a career in this field at some point in the future. We don't want to let them down. We don't want to scare them. We don't want to violate their autonomy. We want to promote their interests, prevent harm, and cure them if we can. Thus, all healthcare professionals should aspire and be held to virtuous activity and medical professionalism. We want our healthcare professionals to exhibit the virtues of courage, honesty, friendliness, compassion, justice. These are all things that are very important to the proper practice of health care. The authors explain what it means to adhere to some sort of medical professionalism in this context. They give four different characteristics. To adhere to medical professionalism first involves proper use of expert authority related to the medical profession, which is grounded in medical knowledge and expertise. Basically, patients are looking to healthcare professionals as if they have some sort of knowledge and authority over, well, what happens to the human body, what kind of treatments are appropriate what is going to cure them or relieve their pain. The authority and the power that healthcare professionals have in these settings should be exercised for the patient's well-being. They shouldn't use their authority in order to further their own political goals or use their authority to cultivate you know, status or fame or wealth insofar as these people are putting their lives in your hands they should be able to rest assured trusting that you're going to use your authority for their benefit so one part of what it means to be a medical professional to adhere to medical professionalism is the proper use of that authority that you have Another important feature of this is that medical professionals ought to properly mediate between the individual and society. So we're not just concerned with doing right by our patient and exercising our authority for them specifically. Healthcare professionals should also exercise their authority for society generally. And the book chapter gives a few examples of this as well. One of the things that they mention is that insofar as healthcare professionals have such authority, they can use that authority to quote, curb their own patient's deviance, that is, align their patient's interests and actions with broad appropriate social norms, and use that authority to protect individuals from corrosive social influence. Here is one excerpt from the chapter. Under normal circumstances, the patient's goals and society's goals are the same. The patient is sick and wants to get well. Society too wants him or her to get well for any number of reasons, because we care about him or her, because we want the individual to return to being a productive member of society, because we want the patient to cease being a drain on social resources, or because of public health concerns. The patient's goals and society's goals, however, are sometimes inconsistent with each other. And this is where this feature of medical professionalism comes in. In such cases, the medical professional acts as a mediator between individuals and society. Consider, for example, the physician who properly refuses to write a sick note for a well patient who is looking for an excuse to avoid work. In such a case, the quote-unquote deviant is 
mainstreamed through the intercession of the professional. On the other hand, professional authority is sometimes used to create safety zones for individuals against the demands of social norms. Consider, for example, the physician who properly excuses his or her sick patient from having to go to work, thereby protecting society, right? Or the psychiatrist who testifies as an expert that the defendant in a criminal case was insane at the time he or she committed a criminal act and therefore is not guilty by reason of insanity. As healthcare professionals, y'all are in a unique uh, place in order to intercede for the uh, individual and to try to protect the well-being of the public. So part of what it means to be a medical professional is to properly mediate both between the individual, their desires, their health, and the desires and the health of society. So authority should be exercised for both patient and society's sake. These things both need to be considered and balanced in the appropriate way. Obviously, this leads naturally into another characteristic of medical professionalism which is we want our healthcare professionals to be guided by the proper motivations. We don't want their actions to be aimed at cultivating power or wealth or achieving their own personal goals. We want their energies sublimated into working for patient and working for society for the individual's benefit and for the public's benefit. Thus, we don't want people in medical professions who are going to abuse their power and authority and aren't actually going to look out for their patients. Right? Normally, in these settings, this is something that we don't have to worry about too much because insofar as healthcare professionals are working in a public setting, there are kind of all of these checks and balances on this kind of self-interested behavior getting out of hand. But basically, the long short of it is that insofar as we want our healthcare professionals to adhere to medical professionalism, we want them to be guided by the right motivations, virtuous motivations, having good intentions. The last characteristic in regards to medical professionalism that the authors mention is the making of proper professions. And by this they mean like verbal proclamations or nonverbal proclamations. In other words, healthcare professionals should be making explicit and implicit professions about their commitments to upholding the principles of medical ethics, looking out for the well-being of their patients, and looking out for society. It's been argued by some medical experts and bioethicists that these professions should be made in public, like the Hippocratic Oath, for example, and implicitly through the interactions with healthcare professionals' patients. Edmund Pellegrino, for example, one of the titans in bioethics, has this to say about professions. Profession occurs in two ways. One is the public profession, the solemn proclamation on graduation from medical school when the oath is taken. This is the moment when the newly graduated physician enters the profession, not when she deceives, receives her degree. The degree is simply evidence of completion of the academic requirements for the degree Doctor of Medicine. It says nothing of the commitment to the way the acquired knowledge and skill are to be used. Without the oath, the Hippocratic Oath usually, the doctor is a skilled technician or laborer whose knowledge fits him for an occupation but not a profession. When the oath is proclaimed, 
if it is taken seriously as a binding commitment to place one's special knowledge and skill at the service of the sick, the graduate has then made his profession. He or she enters the company of others with similar commitments. At this moment, one enters a moral community whose defining purpose is to respond to and to advance the welfare of patients, those who are ill, who are in need of help, healing, or relief of suffering, pain, or disability. The second way the profession is declared is in the daily encounter with patients. Every time a physician sees a patient and asks, what can I do for you? What is wrong? What is the problem? He or she is professing, that is committing oneself, to two things. One is competence, that is having the knowledge and skill to help, and the other is to use that competence in the best interest of the patient. This profession or commitment by its very declaration invites trust. The doctor voluntarily promises that he can be trusted and incurs the moral obligations of that promise. Thus, the chapter ends with describing, outlining what the Hippocratic Oath is, which used to be an oath that needed to be taken by those who are entering the medical profession. That is as follows. I will apply dietetic measures for the benefit of the sick according to my ability and judgment. I will keep them from harm and injustice. I will neither give a deadly drug to anybody who asked for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. Similarly, I will not give to a woman an abortive remedy. Whatever houses I may visit, I will come for the benefit of the sick, remaining free of all intentional injustice, of all mischief, and in particular of sexual relations with both female and male persons. What I may see or hear in the course of the treatment, or even outside of the treatment, in, to re in regard to the life of men, which on no account one must spread abroad, I will keep to myself. So here we see within this profession, this public declaration, commitments to beneficence and non-maleficence. Interestingly, prohibitions of physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia prohibition of abortion, prohibition of sexual relations with patients, which is less controversial, and a commitment to confidentiality. I don't believe that the Hippocratic Oath, however, is required um, for all of those who are entering the medical profession now. And I don't have the knowledge to back this up, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was changed insofar as abortion and physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia are becoming more accepted in certain cases within the medical community. Basically, the entire point of the second half of this chapter is to provide a general framework for what constitutes violations of medical practice and how one generally adheres to standards of medical professionalism. Obviously though, society changes, it develops, and it brings with it all different kinds of changing values and norms and technological advancements. Thus, sometimes codes of conduct may change and what constitutes professionalism may change as well. In light of such changes, the last thing that's mentioned in this chapter is the 2002 publication of the Charter on Medical Professionalism, which called on healthcare professionals to reaffirm their professions and professional commitments due to the technological advancements that have occurred within the last few centuries. In that charter, Various organizations called on healthcare professionals to reaffirm their commitment to 10 professional commitments, basically. These were professional competence, honesty with patients, confidentiality, maintaining appropriate relations with patients, 
improving quality of care, improving access to care, just dis distribution of finite resources, scientific knowledge, maintaining trust and managing conflicts of interest, and adhering to one's professional responsibilities. Carrying these out constitutes adhering to medical professionalism. What does that mean? Well, in other words, it basically means using your knowledge and skills appropriately for the appropriate goals, utilizing the appropriate means used for the patient's well-being and for society's sake. Thus ends Chapter 5 of Medical Ethics and Humanities. I hope you found this information interesting, and I look forward to seeing what y'all have to say in your discussion posts. If you have any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to email me. Otherwise, I will see you next time. Okay, bye-bye.